We're going all over the place today because the resurrection is mentioned all over the place. And not only is it mentioned all over the place, but it is also experienced and felt all over the place. And especially now, in this particular season that we're in right now, it's interesting that there will be a witness in the skies about the resurrection, I believe. And I'm going to get into that in just a minute. But before I do that, let's get to the Word of God. Luke 21, 25 says, and to th this morning I'm going to talk about the signs of the resurrection. There are some ancient signs of the resurrection. There are some old signs of the resurrection. And there are also some new signs of the resurrection that I'm going to get into. So put your listening ears on. Get ready, get ready. Because here we go. Luke 21, 25 says this, And there will be signs. Say that with me. There will be signs. Right? Hallelujah. In the sun. How about that? In the moon. And in the stars. And on the earth. Distress of nations. With perplexity. What meaneth this, Lord? We will be. Some will be scratching their chin. Hopefully not us. The sea and the waves roaring. So we're going to see some signs. We're going to see some signs of the power of God. We're going to see uh, the resurrection Lord, resurrected Lord in action. And uh, praise the Lord. I see a lot of you taking notes. Praise the Lord this morning. It's interesting what God is going to do. So we live in a unique time right now. We're going to go over the history, of course, when, when we uh, come on days like today, we call today Resurrection Sunday. I don't want to call it what the Romans and the Greek call, call it, Easter. I want to call it Resurrection because that's what it is. Amen? Amen? It's not to some foreign god or whatever. It's to giving praise to Jesus for the resurrection, His resurrected body. All right. So this is a, a unique time that we live in. And uh, we're going to see this verse in some other scriptures this morning. Amen? So buckle your seatbelt. Praise the Lord. Now, let's first of all read about uh, the, the resurrection because it's important. And I want you to go with me to John chapter 20. And let's start with what already happened this morning. And yes, beloved, there is a resurrection. There has been a resurrection. Praise God. Jesus rose from the dead. Scripture is very clear about that. Like Todd said, uh, there's more written about Jesus than Julius Caesar. I believe that. Yep, amen. And, and uh, uh, some other people too he could have put in that, uh, that quote. But anyway, number one, uh, the discovery of the em empty tomb. That was a sign. Praise God. Talking about signs this morning. John 20. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Praise God. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who was that? Quiz time. John. John, right? The other disciple Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where he, they have laid him. Notice she is the most uh, convenient explanation for that. That they, they just stole the body. There are, there are some grave robbers. They stole the body. So there's a, there's a, there was a learning curve, and Jesus understood that for his disciples about the resurrection. The resurrection was huge, a huge event that took some time for, for him to de describe and for him to go through and act out and it, for the revelation to hit them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so there was a learning curve there. Now I want to cut, I'm going to come back to John 20, but I want to cut quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Because this is what Paul says about the resurrection, and we need to understand this also. He says this, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And we know there was a group of, of priests that walk, walked around at that time. They were the Sadducees, and they didn't believe in a resurrection. That mankind would be resurrected one day. And uh, they just believed that man was going to die, and that was it. All right? We call that annihilation, but uh, that, wasn't, that isn't the case at all. 
Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So if the dead don't rise, Christ didn't rise either. So he's just making an argument right now for the, for the other side, but showing the, the stupidity of believing that there is no resurrection. Verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Verse 15, yes, and we are found false as false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he, is, he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. He said it again, twice. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. If you, still, you are still in your sins, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So what he's saying is, we run around preaching about the resurrection, but if that didn't happen, we are pitiful people. Mm -hmm. That we would declare something so hopeful to, to the world if it didn't take place and if it didn't happen and it wasn't going to happen to us. Right? So here's Mary Magdalene uh, comes to the tomb, sees the stone rolled away. From what the Lord has told her, she probably should be rejoicing at this moment, but it doesn't dawn on her exactly what happened. All right? But Paul says, Paul says, if there was no resurrection, we would be a pitiful people. All right? Number two, there was a race to the tomb. How many of you remember that? There was a race. All right? How many of you like races? All right? What a NASCAR race, though. It was a foot race. Uh, so, yes, there was a resurrection. We're going to say that again. John 20, verse 3. Peter therefore went out and the other disciples and were going to the tomb. And they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. So John won the foot race. At least it looked like. Well, John ran faster, but Peter went farther. Remember that. Mm -hmm. John ran faster, Peter went farther. There's a, there's a lesson in there somewhere. Okay? Verse 5. And he stooped down looking into it. That's, uh, that's uh, John. Saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. And I know in, on the internet there's a lot of conjecture about the folded napkin. And uh, the Hebrew custom was a folded napkin meant you were coming back for more. <laughs> I had to mention that. I don't know if that's what was, was meant here, but it certainly is tempting to, to uh, think, well, Jesus stopped to fold that napkin so that... Uh, he was telling everybody, look, I'm, you know, I get, there's more. There's more here. There's more yet to see. Praise God. Verse 8. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went and also, about time, buddy, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. There we go. Then the disciples went away again to their own home. So again, we see the resurrection learning curve. Amen? The resurrection learning curve. You know, I, I think about when I first got saved. And I'll tell you what made the resurrection real was that when I asked Jesus to come into my heart, He made Himself so real to me that I had to believe in the resurrection. I had to. I know it just went against everything I had ever been taught in my life. You know, most of the people I hung around with were pessimists. And once you die, you die. That's it. Don't give me any of that religious stuff. But when I met Jesus, I knew the resurrection was real. Mm -hmm. Because I knew Him. Praise God. Amen. So that's why I said there was, there was a learning curve. Number three, there were eyewitnesses. Okay? So not only was there a foot race to the, to the tomb, but there were also eyewitnesses there. I want you to look at John 20, 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. 
And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels. How about that? Two angels in white, sitting one at the head and the other at the feet. Kind of looked like the Ark of the Covenant, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Huh. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Huh. How about that? No. There's no word for coincidence in Hebrew, by the way. <laughs> I digress. Here we go. Okay. It's all two angels in white. You saw, we read that. Verse 13. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Those Romans snatched the body. No. Verse 14. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Well, why didn't she know it was Jesus? Because he looked different. He looked different. He was glorified. He was glorified. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, I love this, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will... I, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. You know, when the Lord calls your name. Oh, come on. Whoa. <laughs> Did he call your name? Mm. I knew it was him when he called my name. Hallelujah. The Bible says he's even got a new name for you. Praise God. We sing it. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. That's all I'll give you. Okay? Uh, so uh, she looked at him I'll finish that verse she turned to him and said Rabboni which is to say teacher so understand this woman was the first eyewitness among many so there are other eyewitnesses if we go back to 1 Corinthians 15 you got to go back and forth see and you get a lot you get a lot more detail today is a day we live in a day where we have to let the scripture interpret other scriptures and not, not only that, but other things that talk about Scripture. There's a guy, man by the name of Josephus. He's also, he's very good to read. Is it Scripture? No. But it's history. And there are some details and some things that will build your faith even more if you read those. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 says, For I delivered to you first of all, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. So it was prophesied, right? We can depend on prophecy. And there is still prophecy today. Verse 4. And that he was buried and then he rose again the third day according to what? Again, the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, who was Peter, then by the twelve, and then he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. So, beloved, there were eyewitnesses. Amen? Probably more than Julius Caesar had. Anyway... Uh, he says, uh, where did I leave off? 500 and once, and the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time, or not, one, not, one born not at the same time as they were. He, Paul came later, and actually Jesus appeared to Paul, uh, literally on the road to Damascus. Uh, Psalm 16, verse 10. And here's the direction the rest of the message will go. I want you to look at this verse. Very important for us to understand today. He said this, Psalm 16.10, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Where is Sheol? Is that like right next to Secaucus, New Jersey? Where is Sheol? <laughs> kind of looks like it anyway. But anyway, I digress again. But he says, you will. so Sheol is a place... It, it, it was not only just a place, I believe it's a literal place, but I also believe it was a place where if death was claiming your physical body and you knew it, you were in the throes of Sheol. And there's a, there's a few people, a few characters in the Bible that we can say were in the throes of that. One was who? Jesus, right? Sunday school answer. But also David wrote this, and he was also in the throes of this. 
But there was also another person, and, and actually there are several other people, but another person I'm going to talk to, I won't spoil it right now, but he said, the second part of the verse, nor will you allow your Holy One to see, think, remember this word, to see corruption. Corruption is what happens after we die. Right? We corrupt. We, we, we fall apart. Okay? So David is saying this as a prophetic word of what's going to... Jesus rising from the dead. Right? Rising from the dead. He's not going to stay in the tomb. He's going to rise. Just like David said, I've been through a lot of circumstances, Lord, where it looked like I was going down. I was in the throne of, uh, throes of death. And you rescued me. We need to remember that in these days. Mm -hmm. The Lord is the Lord will rescue you. Frank had a, has a glorious scripture in Jeremiah that God gave to him about him sparing the remnant. It's beautiful. Have have Frank <coughs> read that to you uh, sometime today. All right. So anyway, um, I want to read to you something that was written uh, by a, a Baptist preacher. Uh, we love Baptists. Do we love Baptists? Sure, Amen. we love Baptists. Amen. We're non-denominational. We love everybody. Okay. So he says this. He says, uh, and this is talking about seeing corruption and being in, in Sheol. He says this. The picture of descent. Now this is, he's a, he, he, this man teaches at a, uh, at a seminary. So, you know, look closely at his words because some of these words we don't use in our no, normal vocabulary. All right. The picture of descent and return. So that's resurrection is more than a poetic fancy. For the psalmist to be already in the region of death, which we just read, means that they are in death's power. Okay? The experience of Yahweh's power to deliver them was a step towards the belief that his sovereignty over the world of the dead would in the future be asserted in bringing the dead back to the world of the living in the eschatological resurrection, that means when he blows the trumpet and the dead in Christ rise first, and then we that remain will go to meet him in the air. That's what this is talking about. That's what the resurrection points to. That's why Paul said, if, if, if there was no resurrection, we'd be hopeless and pitiful. But in Jesus Christ, and that's why I sang living hope this morning. Alyssa <laughs> said to me, she said, boy, you sing that song a lot. Well, guess what? It's because Jesus is my living hope. And he's where Amen. I put all my hope. Amen. And, and so my hoper is full. Praise God this morning. That was a joke. You can laugh. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, I know it hurts. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so I want to talk about something that Jesus talked about and tie this in with what we're talking about this morning. And the day that we live in, believe it or not, even though we're going to talk about somebody named Jonah. Because if you noticed on that slide, I had somebody else listed with David as someone who was in the throes of Sheol, but yet God saved him. And Jonah is a great picture of that. And so when the Pharisees came to Jesus, I'm going to read it to you, and he gave them an answer to a question that they had. So let's read it, Matthew 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Give us a sign, Lord. <laughs> and what did he answer him? He said, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And I'm telling you, the sign of the prophet Jonah was an unintended sign. Because there was no way that Jonah wanted his experience in the belly of a fish to be a sign, but yet it was. Hallelujah. Verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah was, is here. And he was talking about himself. So he said that the picture and the prophetic picture that Jonah gave was a picture and it was a sign 
that is given to that generation that asked for a sign in the heavens. Notice they were asking for a sign in the heavens. And he says, I'm not going to give you that, but I'm going to give you a sign of the prophet Jonah in your generation to understand. Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so was I in the belly of the earth for three days, and then I rose from the dead. Now, here's where it gets more interesting. Archaeolog archaeological, that's hard to say, say that three times fast, scholar David Weissman, former curator at the British Museum. When you say British Museum, I pause, I stop. Because want, I, want, I do not want to go to Britain. I don't. But I do want to go to the British Museum. Because it's probably, I, I mean, the most accurate, you know, biblically accurate museum on the face of this earth. Okay? And I know some people will disagree with me, but I, I believe it is. Anyway, he's from the British Museum, a leading expert on Assyrian culture. And so we're, we're going to be talking about the Assyrian culture of Jonah. But he speculated that a solar eclipse did occur over Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, in Jonah's day. Now, how do you do that? You get the software. And you go back to the, that particular time and date, and you see exactly what happens in the software. We do that often. Biblical scholars do that often. And there, there is evidently an eclipse at the time of Jonah. Now, why is that significant? Well, give me a few minutes and I'll get to it, okay? Number one, where Jonah was at, they worshipped the god Dagon. And uh, Dagon was uh, w what we would call the fish god. The, uh, the, the Philistines worshipped him, also the Assyrians worshipped Dagon. And Dagon was, you know, the, uh, this uh, picture on the uh, left-hand side, they made little statues of this fish. If you watch the veggie tail, uh, they, don't, they don't go for the fish god, they go for fish slapping. You're going to have to watch the video anyway. They did, they they did remember? Yeah, because yeah. yeah, that was a reference to the fish, the fish god. god. So if you got the veggie tail, I think I have it. If you really want to borrow it and you really want to watch it, it's kind of cute anyway, but it totally messed up the story. Anyway, we go. <laughs> we go. But I had to mention that. I'm sorry. I resisted to the temptation. Anyway, what happened to Dagon, they put, uh, it's in uh, 1 Samuel 5, 2, and uh, what happened was, and I'm, I'm not going to read it, I'll just let you uh, see the picture on the right-hand side. They brought the Ark, of, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. Most of you know the story. And they uh, put it in, the, uh, in Dagon's temple. And so uh, they, they all went to bed at night thinking, oh, the Ark's in there, and Dagon, and... You know, Dagon's greater than the ark, and we all know that, so we can go to sleep that night. When they woke up the following morning, this was where, uh, and this is a Sunday school picture, so we're having Sunday school, praise the Lord. Uh, Dagon fell face down before the ark. Uh, his head was severed, his arms were severed, and uh, honestly, he looks like a piece of salmon to me. <laughs> I'm getting hungry for lunch. Anyway, to, to show the, the, the power of God. Mm -hmm. against the gods that these Assyrians that Jonah's going to go to, uh, you know, that this is what they believed in. Anyway, and out of, of course, out of the sea, and that has a whole, a whole lot of significance. But I want you to see Jonah's travel plan. And I'll tell you, I'm so glad I found this slide on, the, just, I just Googled it, and there it was. Uh, Jonah's travel plan. Because, let me get my pointer out, because you've got to have a pointer for this. All right. Over here is where Jonah was. This is Israel. This is, uh, this is, Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh. All right. Instead, he went the other direction. And I think he went a little bit out of his way. What do you think? He went, literally, he got a ship in Joppa and, and, and was going to go. I don't think he made it all the way. At least the scripture shows that he didn't. But he was going to run from God and God's call, because he was called to preach repentance to Nineveh. Yeah. Instead, he ran the other way and went. All, it was going to go all the way to Tarshish, which was an island out here past the Strait of Gibraltar, which people back in that day, very superstitious, were not allowed to go past the Strait of Gibraltar, except the seafarers. And so they were going to take him. He paid 
He must have paid a, a pretty penny to try to run away from God. And went all, it was going to go all the way out there instead of a three day journey to Nineveh. All right? That's, this is what running from God looks like. Right up here on the screen. <laughs> I saw this. I, went, I almost did a backflip out of my chair, except I know I was close to 70 and would hurt myself. <laughs> so, but this is a picture of a person running from God. And so how appropriate, amen, for our day. Now, in just a week or so, there's going to be an, uh, an eclipse. It's going to be a solar eclipse. It's going to cross... Oh over these seven cities that I have listed, you see, and I, you have eight listed. I'll tell you why in a minute. All right? This is on April 8th, 2024. Interesting that there was an eclipse at Jonah's time when he went to Nineveh and preached repentance. Well, guess what? There's an eclipse that's coming over the United States. Going to go over, some people say, not everybody agrees with this, okay? I want to tell the truth. Some people say it'll go over seven cities that are named Nineveh. That's where Jonah was supposed to go, right? Some say as little as three. Okay, I'll give you three. Uh, three would spark my attention. But then that bottom city, Jonah, Texas. Going over Jonah, Texas. Wow. So if you got three Ninevehs and one Jonah, it, it at least gets my attention, folks. Mm -hmm. All right? Is God trying to say something? Is God trying to give us a sign? Is God trying to give us a sign, a give a sign out to people that are running? Let me put the slide up. Oh, I got to put it back up. Happen. It is going to be a sign to the people that are running from God to get right with God, just like Nineveh had to repent. This is a sign of the resurrection. Jonah is a sign to those running from the presence of God, and there are many people that are running from the presence of God. You could probably stand up and name a bunch of them right now in this service today. And I know people in my family that are running from God. And so I take this very seriously. This is a sign of the resurrection to this generation. And I want to take it as that. I don't want to make it any more than that, but I do believe it's a sign. And I believe people will see it. And if people will study it and study where it went over and, and what, they'll get a a good revelation of what's going on. So, um, understand, uh, you know, the Ark of God was put in Dagon's temple, and Dagon fell face down. Our God wins. Our God reigns. Hallelujah. Maybe we'll sing that next week. Jonah 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, go, Arise, go to where? Nineveh, right? Three-day journey, three-day walk. That great city and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let's all stop and say, wow, that was a long way. Right? Wow, that was a long way. Thank you, Ed Barnes. He went down to Joppa, and Joppa was, uh, again, in the Gaza Strip there on the coast. They, they were the Philistines. They believed in that fish god too. All right? And uh, he went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare, probably thousands of dollars in his day, and went down into it uh, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. That's what we need to see. And so I want those of you to already uh, feel the hope, sense the hope, that God is going to call again a people running from his presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. So they, he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And he said to them, Pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. All right? <laughs> In other words, what he was saying, if you read after the word for, it says, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. <laughs> See, that's where the point that you have to get to. Is this is because of me. And it's a place where Nineveh is going to have to get. Because Nineveh 
Nineveh is, Jonah's going to give a word to Nineveh, and I'll read it to you in just a moment. And they have to decide whether they're going to let the onus fall on them and say it's because of us, Lord, it's because we've denied you, it's be, and, and admit to it, just like Jonah did. Did Jonah die? When he was in the belly of the fish, did he die? No. Now, if you read the scripture, <laughs> it makes you wonder. Okay, I'm just going to say that. I'm not going to come out and say, he died, ha ha. But I will say, mm -hmm. it's, it's suspicious. What, read with me, Jonah 2.1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. Great place to pray, huh? Must have been a, quite a fragrant place. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me, what? Whoa, wait a minute, out of the belly of Sheol? So what do we read that that man said, the archaeologist? He said, either you are dead or you were in the throes of death when you mentioned Sheol. So he says, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. So God heard him. All right? Verse 6. I went down to the moorings of the mountains, and the earth with its bars, and the word bars are the gates. So the scripture says he went literally down to the gates of Sheol, and they closed behind him. What do we make of that? Hmm. Just saying, okay? You make, you can decide, all right? I'll let you decide. So let's read on. Yet you have brought me up, uh, excuse me, have brought my life up from the pit. The word pit means absolute corruption. If you look at it in the King James, it says, this is the new King James. He says, you, you, what did he say? You have brought me my life up from corruption. There's another word you got to look at. All right? We don't get it in the English as clear as we get it in the Hebrew. All right? Again, not saying he died, but he was at least in the throes of death at that particular time, which gives perfect, uh, makes this a perfect sign of the what? Of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you didn't, forgot the uh, psalm, here it is, Psalm 1610. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Alright, so let's finish Jonah's tale here, which is not a tale, it's the truth. Jonah 3, 4 says, And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be toast. Actually, it says overthrown. Yes. But Nineveh is going to experience the judgment of God. And by the way, it's God's mercy to warn a people. Mm -hmm. So if God is merciful to warn a people, shouldn't we also? Amen. Some will, you know, wrinkle their nose and say, I didn't come here to be judged. No, God's the judge. We're just the, <laughs> we're just the agent to try to spare them from it, right? Look what happened in verse 5. Everybody... So the people of Nineveh believe God. Not the fish God. Not the God that got broken up before the Ark of the Covenant. But they believed Almighty God. God. Jonah warned them, and they believed God. Shouldn't we be warning people? Amen. Mm -hmm. So they'll believe God? Yes. Right? No wonder that, you know, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and... and Daniel go, tell us to do this, and we just turn a blind eye to it. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth, from the greatest to the least of them. I want you to see some of this. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh. He's always the last one to know, right? <laughs> came to the king of Nineveh. What did the king of Nineveh do? He arose from his throne and laid aside his robe. He, he did... He said, I'm not king anymore. I want a you guys. Or like we say in New Jersey, you guys. What? I want a you. I'm repenting with the rest of you. What repentance? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And what did God do? He relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. He did not 
do it. Glory to God. Now, you tell me that there's nothing that we can do to change the future. Go ahead and try it. What is that when they sit at a desk and say, try to convince me or whatever on a, on a college campus? What's that? Change, change my mind. mind. Yeah. Well, t somebody try to change my mind. I don't think it's going to happen, though. We can change the future. Exposing the sins of the nation are not off limits biblically. And we as God's people have to be declaring it. That's part of your walk with God. Jonah said, this is because of me. He repented. People of Nineveh said, this is because of us. They repented. Those that are running this morning, I want to give you hope. Amen? Because of the power of, of the resurrection, the people can be saved and will be saved. The people believe God. So d please, don't tell me that there's nothing we can do. There is. And God is calling us this morning. He's calling us to be His servants and to speak the truth of the resurrection. Amen? We live in a great day. And beloved, God's given us a sign. He's given us a sign that the people are running. People that we love dearly are running. But they're going to come back. They're going to come back. And God is going to do everything in His power to get them back. And I really felt this morning as I was praying that there are several of us here this morning and there are several that are watching that you're concerned about that. You really are. You're Amen. concerned about your family. You're concerned about your loved ones. But I want you to understand this morning, I want to comfort your heart, especially today, the day of the resurrection, or the day we celebrate the resurrection anyway, that, that, that God is on it. He's on it. He's on it. And beloved, He will use you too. He will use you. I have family that are away from God right now. I don't believe He's going to use somebody else. He's going to use me. He's going to use you. And, and your prayers are before the God and they're going to be answered this morning. Amen? And that's the hope of the resurrection. You're not a pitiful group of people. There was a resurrection. And God is active in doing that work in your family, in your city, and wherever you may walk. Praise His holy name. That's the power of the resurrection. Father God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you would bless this church, you would bless those that are watching this morning, that there would be a strong anointing of your spirit to believe you and to trust you.